Hi folks and welcome back to the Advantage Applications channel. My name's Rich and today I wanted to make a short video on a topic that I see brought up from time to time online in forums and it's also been discussed at my work in meetings and that is, is Microsoft Access still a viable development platform to build custom tools for the modern office? And the short answer is yes, absolutely it is, but not exactly as it was originally intended. Access was meant to be a standalone database solution for a very small business or a small department with maybe one to five users uh, concurrently in the database at a time. It was probably meant to run on a single workstation or maybe over a local area network, again, for a small number of users, and those users would have been hardwired onto that network. And there were some pretty severe limitations when you use Access in this way. Um, since it's file-based, wherever the database file resided, anyone that was going to use that database needed read, write, edit, and delete permission to that folder where the file resided. And that meant that the file could inadvertently get deleted, renamed, copied, older versions copied over it. Information could have been updated or changed in some inadvertent ways. It was vulnerable. It was prone to data and code corruption. And the more users you had in the database concurrently, the greater that risk went up. And also using the database over a remote connection like VPN was pretty much a non-starter. It was painfully or prohibitively slow, and again, the risk for corruption went way up if you tried to connect and use it over VPN or something like that. So how then is Access best used today in the modern work environment? Well, in my opinion, it's really well suited as a rapid application development tool when the data resides in a more robust database server, like SQL Server, uh, any database system that allows ODBC connections, or my personal favorite, SharePoint. And I'm going to show you the way that I configure my solutions when they are Access front-end, and SharePoint backend. I'm going to go over some of the advantages of setting it up like that. And in fact, I'm going to start a series of videos on how to create a solution where Access is the front end and SharePoint's the back end. Some special considerations that you need to think about when you're first starting up a project like that. And eventually even how to migrate an existing Access database, no matter how long it's been in use, to a SharePoint backend. So if that sounds like something you'd be interested in, consider subscribing. And uh, let's go ahead and get into it. Okay, the first development tool that I'm going to show you that you get in Microsoft Access that is really awesome is the Table Designer. I've already got a few tables made in this database and a form, but I'm going to go ahead and create a new table just to show you how it works. So we're going to come up to our Create menu here, and there are a lot of options obviously in this menu, and there are actually more than one way to create a table, but I'm just going to show you one. I go to Table Design, and here I can define the names of the fields I want in my table, and also what data types those fields will be. So the first field that I'm going to put in here is overtime ID. I'm going to let that be an auto number field and I'm going to make it my primary key. When I'm working on a project that I know ultimately is going to reside in SharePoint as far as the data goes, I always explicitly name the ID field. I don't just use a generic ID name for that field. I give it a name that actually makes sense for the table that it's in. The reason I do this is because SharePoint is going to add new fields to this table whenever we export it out. And using a generic field like ID sometimes conflicts with the names of the fields that SharePoint assigns. The next field I'm going to add is overtime date. And again, I don't like to ever name a field just date because that, that definitely has conflict with reserved words in Access and other applications as well. I'm going to define the data type as date slash time, and I'm going to specify a format down here too. I'm going to use short date. And this again is another really cool thing about Access Table Designer. It is very much like a really high-end database application like SQL Server, for instance, where you can set formatting, input masks, default values, captions, and in fact on this one I'm going to put a default value of the current date. Okay, the next field that I'm going to add is going to be caused by and this is actually going to map back to the T, uh, TBL employee over here. So it's not going to store text. It's actually going to store an identity from this table as a foreign key here. So this is going to be a number. And it's format as default to long integer. That's perfect. Now I'm going to enter work crew ID. This is also going to be a foreign key from TBL work crew. Then I'm going to add job ID. Another foreign key field. So it's a number. Then hours. This will be, this, this database is going to be like an overtime database. I used this in another one of my videos, and uh, now I'm just going to use it to kind of demonstrate this as well. 
but the idea is that people can come in here and track their overtime hours. So instead of short text, obviously I want this to be a number. And instead of just whole numbers, I'm going to format it so that it's a decimal, single precision. And I'm going to change the decimal places from auto to two. After that, I'm going to create a comment field. This will be text, but not short text. I want to make it long text so that it'll accommodate more than 255 characters. Okay, that's it. I'm going to save this table as TBL overtime. And it pops up over here in the navigator. And in a moment when I'm ready to export these out to SharePoint, it will keep all of that formatting. All right, the next thing I'm going to show you that I use in Access quite a bit is the relationship designer so that you can define the relationships between your tables. Now, to be honest, I don't really use this a whole lot with solutions that are going to reside on SharePoint because SharePoint doesn't support the relationships that you define in Access. But that's not a big deal because I can define those relationships in my queries on the front end and also in the forms if they use combo boxes and things like that. And I can also do it in code. So it's not that it's limiting, it's just SharePoint doesn't use it. But I want to show you how it works real quick anyway. So here under Database Tools, I can click Relationships. Then I can just drag tables over from my navigation pane here. We'll start with table over time. And I'll take table job. And we see job ID is here and job ID is here is a foreign key. It's the primary key in TBL job. So I can just click and drag that primary key to the foreign key in this table. And it's going to pop up a relationships window. And it says table job to table over time. Job ID field in table job and job ID field in table over time. That's what we're relating. I'm going to go ahead and check uh, enforce referential integrity. And you can even set up cascading updates and deletes. I'm not going to do that for this relationship. But when I click create, you can see that it sets up a one to many relationship. And I can do the same thing with TBL employee, as I mentioned earlier. Caused by field over here maps back to employee ID. We do the same thing. We have another one to many. And I would do that with work crew as well. Work crew ID is a primary key here, and it is a foreign key here. Enforce referential integrity, click create, and there we go. So if I were if I was keeping this solution in access, which I don't recommend, but even if I was migrating it out to SQL Server using their SQL Server migration assistant, it would keep these relationships as we define them here. And once you define the relationships like that, it carries through in queries and forms and reports and everything you do in the database. So it's pretty handy. All right, so now let's say that we've actually got data in our TBL overtime table. If we open the form, it would look like this. Basically, we have the date overtime was taken, who took the overtime, which work crew they were a part of, which shift basically, what the job was, and how many hours was worked. And I show you this because the third thing that I want to show you in Access that you have is a development tool that is really handy. I think it's very powerful is a graphic uh, query designer. So again, we come into our create menu and you can use query wizard to create certain types of queries. And this can be really easy, especially uh, this find unmatched query wizard. I won't go into what that is, but I do use that from time to time. Otherwise, I tend to just create my queries on my own. So I go into query design. And again, I can pull tables over from my navigation pane, or I can use the add tables pane that pops up over here on the right. So let's say that we wanted to write a query to total and sum all of the hours for each employee that's taken overtime. To do this, we know we're going to need the overtime table. So we double click it and we get it here on our query panel. I'm going to close the property sheet here. And we could start just as it is right here without linking this to other tables. And I'll show you what that looks like. And then I'll show you why we link it to other tables. Since all we're really interested in is totaling and summing hours for each employee individually, all I really need is the employee ID, which in this case would be the caused by, and the overtime hours. Now, if I ran this just as is, it's already a select query, and I could define queries to make new tables. I could define queries to append data to existing tables. I could define queries to update data in tables, make changes to that data, in other words. I can make cross-tab queries and delete queries. Also, union pass-through and data definition queries. I'm going to keep it real simple today just with a select query, but this is a really powerful tool. And you can not only connect to access tables, but you can connect to Excel. You can connect to any database that exposes ODBC connections. And you, of course, you can connect to linked SharePoint lists. 
So if I run this now, it's going to pull in everything because I have no filters, no parameters, no conditions on this data whatsoever. So now if I go into query design and I click my totals icon here, I get a new row here that says total. And I'm going to leave it group by cause by. That's going to group it into the employees. And then I'm going to sum on hours. Now if I run the query, now each of these IDs correlates to an employee and TBL employee. And this is the total hours that they worked in the data set that we have. But this number isn't very useful to us. So let's change the query so that it actually displays the employee name. Go back into design view. And now I'm going to pull in TBL employee. And you see my relationship pops right up here because we've already defined it in the relationship panel. But if it didn't, we could define the relationship right here again. And that's what I do when I link to SharePoint lists because SharePoint won't hold relationship information about these tables on its own. Whenever I use a query, I just redefine that relationship in here. It takes a little extra time, but it's really not a big deal. Okay, so I'm going to bring in last name and first name. I'm going to create a new display field called full name. And I'm going to define it as the last name field. And I'm going to concatenate a comma and space and then concatenate the first name field. Now I can uncheck last name and first name here since I don't need it represented in the query at all because I'm going to have full name that's going to show up. And I want to click and drag that just to the left of ours so that it still makes sense. As a matter of fact, I don't need caused by either because I don't need that identity to show up. Okay, now if I run the query, my results look like this and it makes a lot more sense. It looks much nicer. Okay, so now let's say that I wanted to give that some kind of parameter like a date range. I don't want to see everything in the data table. I want a specified date range to look at. I can go back into design view. So since I want to filter on date now, I'm going to need to pull it in from TBL overtime. And I'll pull this all the way to the left. And instead of group by, I'm going to say that this is going to be a where condition. And I'll go ahead and define it explicitly here. And we'll say it's between February 1st of this year and February 29th of this year, since it was a leap year. Now, it just so happens that all of the data in this table over time is for February. And that's because it's just some test data that I put in. So we'll actually narrow that down a bit right here in our criteria expression. We'll say that we're going to 215. All right, let's run that and our numbers update. And we could actually break that down even further. We could have it grouped by jobs underneath employees and that would work. It would break out even further. Uh, there's just a whole lot you can do with it. Anything you can do with SQL, you can do in this query designer. And as a matter of fact, you can actually view the SQL directly and modify it. Or what I do is copy it. Sometimes I'll come in here and I will design a query and then I'll copy the code into my VBA and then tweak it there. And that way I don't have to define parameters or certain relationships explicitly. I can do it later in code dynamically. So it is a really, really handy and powerful tool. It's one of the things I use the most in my solution development. And we save it and we see it shows up here in our navigation pane under queries. The next thing that makes Access a very powerful application development environment is its form designer. This form here is a good example. Let's look at it in design view and then I'll show you how it works. So in design view, you can come up to form design here in the menus and you have a whole set of custom controls that you can add to your form, including text boxes, list boxes, combo boxes, option groups, tabbed forms, sub forms, images, charts, graphs. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff that you can do in here. It's a lot like Visual Studio and everything in here is customizable with code. Access has its integrated language, Visual Basic for Applications, VBA, 
and you can write some really powerful code to loop, to make decisions, to modify attributes and properties, and also to automate tasks. It's really powerful. And to get to the VBA editor, you just come in here and choose properties. And you have a tabbed panel that opens up here. And in this tab panel, you can modify all of the attributes and properties of the form or whichever control you have selected. You can see that the properties window here updates when I select control. And here I have the submit button selected. If I go to the event tab on the click event here, you see that I have event procedure listed there. And if I click the little ellipsis to the right, it takes me to the code that runs when that button is clicked. And I won't go through this code right now. I have a couple videos that you can check out if you want to learn how to work with record sets in VBA, or if you want to learn how to execute SQL from VBA, I'll put the links to those videos in the description. And also all of the practice files and all of the source code that I go over in these videos is available to my members. I'll put a link in the description on how you can become a member of the channel as well. It costs less than a cup of coffee and you can cancel at any time. So let me show you what this form does real quick just based on the code that I have written. Come and put it into form view. The idea is someone can come into the controls here at the bottom of the form, select a date, I'll just pick today, select a person that may be absent or a need for overtime. We'll say that Skylar is gonna be out. Based on the information in TBL employee, it knows that she works shift C and that her primary job is wait staff. And so now I can come in here and just put how many hours of overtime this absence requires and click submit. And it comes right up here and pops it into the list. And this is just a really simple example. I mean, you can write code to do a lot of powerful stuff in VBA. And it's a relatively simple language to learn. And when it comes to VBA, you can come into your create menu here and you can create code modules to build your own functional libraries for any specific tasks that you might be building. You can even build classes if you're into object oriented programming. And you can record macros, but that doesn't really use VBA. And to me, it just isn't as powerful as if you actually learn to code and tell access explicitly what you want it to do. And for the sake of being thorough, I do need to mention that access has a built-in report generator. You can design your reports to have summarized data, group data, filtered data, and you can also have graphs and charts on the report as well. But this is one area that access is really starting to show its age. And it's definitely not what I consider one of its stronger points. There are a lot more powerful solutions out there like Power BI and even Excel as an analytical tool. Excel has a lot more flexibility than what you get in Access's report designer. Okay, so let's say that we've used Access now. We've developed a solution. It's ready for export out to SharePoint before we distribute it. And by the way, that is definitely how I recommend to do this. I definitely recommend making your tables local first testing all your code, testing all your functionality, then exporting those tables out to SharePoint. So then I can just right click on the table that I want to export. I choose export from the context menu and SharePoint is an option right on that menu. Select the SharePoint site that you want to migrate it out to. You can open the list when it's finished. I'll go ahead and leave that checked. Most of the times I uncheck that, but for this demonstration, I'll leave it checked and we can look at it. I'll click OK. You may be prompted for your credentials. I've logged in pretty recently, so I'm not going to be prompted right now. It moves the data out. And here it is now as a SharePoint list. Now to link back to that list, what I would do is come back into access and I'm going to delete this local version TBL employee. So I go to external data, new data source, and I want to choose from online service and you see SharePoint is right here at the top of that list. I click that. That again is my SharePoint site. I don't want to import the data to a local table. I want to link to the SharePoint list itself. Click next. And here I can come in and it's going to show me all of the lists that I could link to if I wanted to. And since I'm looking for TBL employee right there it is. I just put a check mark beside it and then click OK. And there it is. Okay, I'm going to do that for the rest of these tables. And now that all my tables are linked up, we need to retest the functionality of this database. Okay, so I double click my form to launch it. I come down here to choose a date. We'll go with tomorrow. We'll give this to Hank Schrader. We'll say 2.5 hours. Click submit. And there it shows up at the top of our form. So now we know that our linked tables now residing on SharePoint 
are working with everything that we wrote so far. If we executed this query again, we would also see that it works as well. So what are some of the benefits that you get from migrating the back end out to SharePoint? Well, for one, you can control security a lot better. Whoever you grant permissions to to access your SharePoint site is going to have access to your data by default, but you can also then restrict that further down to each SharePoint list if necessary. I don't know why you would do that with an access database, but if you ever need to, that's a possibility. Another thing is that it's always backed up. You don't have to worry about corruption. It can serve as many concurrent users as you need, and it's highly available over remote connections like VPN. So pretty much everything that Access had as a weakness is addressed when you link up the back end to SharePoint. And as I said, I'm going to be going over more and more real world examples of this as we progress through the video series. We're going to actually take a database that's already in use and migrate it out. And you're going to get to see some of the challenges that you come up against and some of the things that you have to change in the table definitions before you migrate them out to your SharePoint lists. But anyway, I hope this is interesting. If so, like I said, please consider subscribing. And if there's any topics that you would like to see me cover or do a series on, please let me know. Thanks for watching and take care.